नमो दिव्य महादिव्य शिवाय सतत नम नम प्रकृत भद्राय नियता प्रणता स्मता सलूटेशन टू द देवी टू द महादेवी सलूटेशन टू हार हु इज एवर ऑस्पिशस सलूटेशन ऑलवेज टू हार हु इज द प्राइमोडियल कॉज ऑफ क्रिएशन एंड कंट्रोलर ऑफ एवरीथिंग वी अगेन बाउ डाउन टू हार good morning uh, today the title of our talk is das speak the goddess behold me i stand alone and probably many of you uh, know that this time of the year uh, we celebrate worship of the divine mother durga and the following week we generally talk on mother worship this is a special service so uh, sometimes we talk on worship sometimes we talk on mother and sometimes we talk on mother worship so um the principle the supreme cause of the universe that scientists seek to discern indirectly that philosophers attempt to demonstrate through logical reasoning and that enlightened devotees that is gyanis devotees or mahayogins the great ascetics great yogis they directly experience through dhyana the dhyana yoga meditative absorption is known as the supreme consciousness the brahman or paramatman this consciousness is also referred to as the maha shakti or the supreme goddess or maha devi in truth there is no fundamental distinction between consciousness and power chaitanya and shakti and in gospel of sri ramakrishna repeatedly you will hear the same thing the chaitanya and shakti brahma and shakti is same difference in just appearance difference in understanding but same in vedic and vedantic terminology this fundamental principle is generally conceived of meditated upon and worshiped as brahman or paramatman on the other hand in the agamic or tantric tantra the 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 traditions the same non dual principle is conceived of meditated upon and worshiped as the supreme power or the great goddess the embodiment of the conscious brahman in chandi a text within the tantric tradition found in the markandeya purana is it a text contains profound discussions on the majesty of the goddess interspersed with the narrative of various events you will find many stories if you read chandi uh, or devi mahatma or or devi saptashati different name hmm. uh, and same kind of thing you will find in devi bhagavata devi gita uh, they are all those texts you will find in tantric tradition so here in the chandi which uh, uh, which is a part Uh, of markandeya purana so you will find that kind of story and in between the stories you will find this deep philosophy hmm. so the term chandi the term chandika then the name of the devi sometimes we call chandi or chandika the name of the book is sri sri chandi or saptashati chandi and the name of the goddess here mainly is chandika or chandi different name you, you will get again and again hmm. so on that uh, different aspect that is our uh, we, we we try to discuss today hmm. so literally if you uh, 
look at the grammar, Sanskrit grammar, you will find that chandi um, kope, kope means anger. Chandika refers to one who becomes enraged. When the Supreme Brahman, in the form of divine power, abandons its serene nature and assumes a fierce, wrathful form in order to protect the gods or devotees from the oppression of demons, he is, she is referred as Chandi or Chandika. So in the Brahma Sutra, in the Katapanishad and many other Upanishad, we will find same thing, but it is not much elaborated, explained, where that same as aspect that you get in Brahma Sutra, in the Upanishad, in Tantric tradition, they put more stress on that aspect. Hmm. So, like Brahma Sutra, under the section Kampanath, we find the Mahabhaya, the great fear of Brahman. Hmm. And Upanishad, in Taitri Upanishad, you'll find that out of fear of this power of Brahman, the wind blows, the sun rises, fire and Indra perform their respective duties, and death, the fifth, hastens to his task. So this supreme power in Chandi, uh, the supreme power is called Chandi or Chandika. So now we will reflect upon the divine play, this, uh, this aspect uh, of the divine play of the mother, so what will happen to us? At the end of this Bhagavad Gita, we'll find the Devi himself, herself is saying what will happen. If you read, if you, if you contemplate what will happen, all our fears will dissipate. So how will it occur? We'll see at the end. Hmm. And we will feel, you can feel that. So, so <clears throat> to this lecture, the, the title of the lecture, its title uh, draws from the 10th chapter of this text, Chandi, 10th chapter, where the primordial energy of the universe addressing the demon king Shumbha, the name of the king is Shumbha, intoxicated by his power and arrogance, makes a profound declaration in the midst of the battlefield. So the, the title, let us, what the Devi told, behold me, I stand alone. So we'll try to um, contemplate on these three words, behold me, I, and alone. Hmm. So Pasya, behold me. So we can see everything, no? But to understand what you see, it's different. It depends upon your preparation, your mental structure. So behold, he, uh, behold is not a simple thing, as we think. Hmm. The story of Shumbha and Nishumbha is one of the most significant episodes in the Sri Sri Chandi. So Nishumbha was his brother. Hmm. It's a tale of divine power, the triumph of good over evil, and the glory of goddess celebrated for her supreme might and benevolence. So the story, it starts from fifth chapter. Why I'm giving this reference? You can, uh, when you return, you can look at the book. <laughs> so the story starts um, in fifth chapter, from fifth chapter. So in ancient times, Shumbha and Nishumbha were two powerful demon brothers who, through intense penance, acquired a boon from Brahma that made them nearly invincible. Empowered by this boon, they usurped the realms of the gods, driving them out of heaven and assumed control of the three worlds. The gods, stripped of their kingdoms, went to the Himalayas, where they invoked the divine mother, Durga, seeking her intervention. So in Chandi, another thing you will find, the beautiful hymns. Beautiful hymns you will find. So here, they started praising the divine mother, um, uh, because they remember in in previous episode that Mahishasur, the killing of Mahishasur, after that when mother disappeared, returned to her abode, he she gave a word. What was the word? So he told that whenever in calamities you think of me, 
that very moment I will put an end to all your worst calamities. So they, they remember that one, Mother told. So they went there in the Himalaya and started praising beautiful hymns. And uh, this stuti, this hymn, is famous as uh, Aparajita stuti also. Uh, Aparajita stuti. So it means Devi of inviolable valor. Parajita means uh, you, you, can, you can conquer somebody. So it is Aparajita, the opposite of that. You cannot conquer. Hmm. So Aparajita stuti. And if you, in Durga Puja, we remember, we, uh, there are many, mm, uh, uh, during, when you are following the rituals, you have to, you need a, 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 a plant, better to say a creeper kind of thing, to for the ritual, that name is Aparajita. So, just I am uh, trying to connect everything. So, with ritual, with philosophy, with story. It is interlinked, you have to understand. Yeah. And the rituals try to remind you about the principle. The stories remind you your principle. And so our goal is to understand the principle so, uh, so that we can, we, we get that fearlessness. Um, hearing the prayers of the gods, the goddess Parvati appeared. From her, a bright, luminous energy, a Shakti, another Devi emerged manifesting as the fierce and resplendent form of Devi Ambika or Kaushiki, different names. If you look at grammar, when you read the book, you will find the meaning of that. Ambika has it, we'll try to cover as much as possible, but I'm afraid, <laughs> so I cannot do that much. So Kaushiki has a different meaning, Ambika has a different meaning. But again, everything will push you to understand the theory. Mm. Mm. She was the very essence of divine strength and valor. Her radiant beauty and power captivated the attention of Chanda and Munda, two demon generals in Shumbha's army. They hurried to their lord and praised the goddess's unparalleled beauty, suggesting that Shumbha should claim her for himself. So now Shumbha, desirous of the goddess, sent his messenger in Vai. Ambassador Sugriva to convey his proposal to her. So here I found some uh, insight about the word envoy. In Sanskrit we call dut. Dut. Dut is the word for envoy, the messenger. What does it mean? There's again grammar, again beauty. So dutam duyate anena yathaktava ditvat poritapyate para iti duta. Two things, Dutta does, the envoy, his duty. So it is highly, uh, uh, that, you know, that evolved philosophy. Means when it is not about your, uh, uh, the spiritual world, in, in, the, in the ordinary, regular, that normal course of life, they thought well about the weapons, different kind of weapons, how to run a kingdom, the administration. Hmm. So anyhow, so two things. So, duyate anena yathakta vaditvat paritapyate para iti duta. One who, through the delivery of precise and appropriate discourse, causes distress to the enemy is referred to as a, an envoy. <laughs> the king, they called charekshana duta mukha. The king, he has. Uh, Spies, spy, eh? their, their, their eyes through spy. <laughs> so spy, he sees. And who is the ear? Duta. And, and who is the, sorry, who is the mouth? Is the duta, mukha. The, he, when, he's, when he speaks, he represents the king, his majesty. He forgets himself. So that is the, that's why they say, through the delivery of a precise and appropriate discourse causes distress, to the enemy is referred to as an envoy. For kings, spies act as their eyes and envoys as their mouths. Without an envoy, matters such as alliances and conflicts cannot be conducted in an orderly manner. Therefore, it is essential for a king to be particularly mindful 
when appointing an envoy, the characteristic of an envoy we find in many Puranas, like Matsa Purana. It says, an envoy must be well versed in the language of the region to which they are sent. If you want to send him in Egypt, <laughs> he have to learn the language, the Egypt, hmm. uh, to, uh, to which they are sent, eloquent, skilled in their duties, and capable of enduring hardships. And, and when you, you speak like that, you, you may not get appropriate welcome. No? <laughs> they may not welcome you. Because you are, you, you are sometimes, you, uh, you are represent the king, some unpleasant word you may have to speak. So, so he must be enduring hardships. They should possess a deep understanding of the appropriate timing and manner for actions to yield the desired results. So uh, additionally, the envoy must be, a, must be a proficient speaker of ethical principles. We call niti shastra, moral conducts, the shastra scriptures. You have to well versed in the ethical principles when needed. A person with these qualities is fit to serve as a king's envoy. So Sugrib went there. Uh, before se uh, sending him, Shumbha told, go and tell her thus in my words and do the thing in such a manner that she may quickly come to me in love. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Sugriva approached the Devi with flattering words, extolling Shumbha's wealth and power, and offered her the chance to become Shumbha's queen. However, the goddess, with calm grace, replied that she had made a vow that only the one who could defeat her in battle would be worthy of marrying her. <laughs> so here the, the, the sloka is beautiful. The sloka says, Ittuktva sa devi gombhir atmasmita jago durga bhagavati bhadra jayedang dharjati jagat. Why I uttered that? Because the deep meaning is there. Hmm? So, first, so uh, let, uh, uh, let me repeat uh, some words. Ittuktva sa tada devi gombhir antasmita jago. E gombhir antasmita jago. This word. And Durga, Bhagavati, Bhadra, Yajedang, Dharjate, Jagat. Let me explain. So the sage spoke, the auspicious goddess Durga, who sustains this universe, upon hearing the words conveyed by the envoy, smiled faintly within herself and responded with a profound and serene expression. So now the commentators are beautifully this one. First, Gambhira. What is the word? They, they meditate upon on, on this verse and Gambhira. What is Gambhira means? Deep and full of hidden intent. Gambhira. So, in Samaskis, Gudha Abhipraya. Gudha, hidden intent. Some deep and full of hidden intent. Because internally, she resolved to destroy the demons, but outwardly, she concealed her intentions. <laughs> that is why she is there. <laughs> uh, then again another. So uh, 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 in Natya Shastra, they called Gambhira. It means women who remain composed in both anger and contentment are called Gambhira. These are women who, in the face of both fury and satisfaction, maintain an unshaken demeanor. How deep, eh? <laughs> so, now Antasmita. Antasmita. Why did the goddess smile inwardly after hearing Shumbha, Shumbha's words through the envoy? Number one, first point. He, she is Durga. What does it mean? Durga means she is difficult to attain. Duradhigamya, difficult to attain. Hmm. Hard to approach. The one who cannot be one even through penances over countless ages, is being sought so easily by Sumbhasura, merely by sending an envoy. These sages, for ages, they are doing spiritual disciplines, life after life, simply sending an envoy. <laughs> you want to get me? Hmm. So, Antasmita, first point. 
Number two, the goddess is Bhagavati. Bhaga means supreme powers, six powers they call. They, um, from there it, it came to Bhagavan also. The goddess is of unfathomable divine majesty. That is meaning of the Bhagavati. Shumbha, the demon king, seeks to attempt her, sorry, seeks to tempt her with a few precious gems because uh, that, that Sugriva, that envoy went, she told Shumbha has this thing, that thing, means from, from Kubera he got this one, from Baruna she, uh, he got that one, from Agni got that, that. so uh, it's a part of his, uh, that, that speech uh, the, uh, that envoy gave. So there, Shumbha, the, the demon king, seeks to, to tempt her with a few precious gems, attempting to win her favor. For this reason, the, the goddess smiled. Number three, this is called meditation, contemplation of, on sloka. She is Bhadra. What is Bhadra means? She is the embodiment of boundless goodness. His embodiment of goodness, Bhadra. Hmm. Shumbhasura, an embodiment of evil, desires to possess her, the very symbol of all, <laughs> uh, of all auspiciousness. The goddess smiled at his audacity. You are the embodiment of evil. Hey, you want to get Bhadra? How is it possible? Not. Four, she is the universal mother. Jagat Janani, Jagat Dhatri. So she is the universal mother, the sustainer of the cosmos. He sustains this world. Shumbhasura, failing to recognize her divinity, seeks her as his wife. The goddess smiled inwardly at his animality. He is a beast like person. So he is the mother of the universe. But she spoke something different. Huh? It's Antasmita. He was smiling inwardly, but she spoke different word. She, what she told? He who, I, I, have, I have a vow. Hmm. He who conquers me in battle, who humbles my pride, and who proves to me my equal in strength shall be my husband. Hmm. So actually the word is not bharta. So it is a two different meaning. Bharta, apparently it, 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 it seems a husband. But bharta means who can hold me, who can understand me. So here also they thought uh, in different thing. First, Jomang Jayati Sangrame. The goddess vow consists of three key, key, key elements. Number one, victory in the battle, battle. Second, the destruction of pride. And number three, the demonstration of equal strength. So these commentators, they thought, they. Uh, that it, uh, uh, it signifies three different yogas, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and jnana yoga. So how it goes? Yomam jayati sangrame. He who conquers me in battle, in the world full of conflicting emotions, such as pleasure, pain, attachment, and aversion, the aspirant who, through the practice of karma yoga, overcomes the threefold qualities of nature, that is sattva, rajas, and tamas, and transcends dualities, becomes worthy of brahma jnana, the knowledge of absolute. Karma yoga, it, it, it deals with emotions. Emotions means that the pleasure and pain, uh, uh, honor and dishonor. And whenever we, you, 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 uh, uh, you work, you'll get all those things. Pain, attachment, I do not like. Uh, I like this kind of work. I do not like this kind of work. But karma yoga helps you to transcend all those dualities. So, so the yomam jayati sangrame, it's some kind of warfare, a battle. Hmm? Number two, yome darpam vyapohati, darpa, pride. He who humbles my pride. From Brahma to the smallest blade of grass, all are enchanted by the great illusion of Mahamaya the great cosmic power, only the devotees through the path of bhakti yoga takes complete refuge in the goddess can transcend 
this invincible maya and attain brahma jnana out of bhakti surrender refuge you have to overcome the pride hmm. so this is bhakti yoga last yo me pratibalo loke he who is equal to me in strength the aspirant to realizes the unity of the individual soul with the supreme through the practice of jnana yoga and attains the non dual knowledge of the self as one with brahman i am one with brahman so is capable of gaining control over me who embodies brahma vidya so this is the way of jnana yoga so it is a way of thinking that's all different opinions about that so we find um, uh, it is not that that commentators out of suddenly in the, in the morning this thought arose in their mind they wrote no they got this hint from the traditional the upanishad again brahma sutra in the uh, uh, there's a beautiful um, from ram prasad uh, this is rasika chandra he wrote about the spiritual battle so rasika chandra wrote very very beautifully come mother to the battlefield of my soul let's see who triumphs your child or fate stole with devotion and worship as twin steeds in flight i draw the bow of wisdom with all my might mounted on the chariot of virtuous grace armed with the arrow of love i wait in my place now enter my battle have no fear of death to the beat of victory i will claim salvation's breath with my tongue chanting roaring your sacred name none can stand against me none in this battle's game it goes on hmm. originally in bengali hmm. rashika chandra wrote like that in upanishad we get in mundaka upanishad we get that taking up the great weapon of the bow prescribed by the upanishads and preparing the arrow sharpened through meditation aim with precision o gentle one draw the bow string with the mind absorbed in contemplation of brahman and pierce the target which is none other than brahman itself it goes on we get different this kind of quotation so now what happened so he told that now you go to your master and therefore let the great asuras shumbhar nishumbha come here without delay defeat me in battle and swiftly take my hand in marriage what need is there for further delay in this matter <laughs> go so here a, 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 a twist is there so this is you know in english also it is there but we are talking about chandi it is in sanskrit so the word is ma mang jitwa king chirena atra paning grihana grihana tu me laghu that is the word paning grihana pani means hand take my hand hey so in tradition is we call another word for marriage in sanskrit is pani grahana just you hold uh, the hand so pani grahana but here is different with my hand i'll fight <laughs> yeah so all those thing and laghu quickly because it it says very beautifully that on the laghu the word suggest the goddess eagerness to annihilate the asuras it is not for marriage <laughs> uh, as indicated by her tone Hmm. this response enraged shumbha and he ordered his generals to forcefully bring the devi to him the so first uh, the mighty demon dhumra lochana was sent to capture her hmm. to make it short we cannot all panchama adhyay is five chapters we cannot discuss everything so dhumra lochana was sent to capture her but the devi's mere utterance reduced him to ashes atas means humkar they called yeah. this fearful his heart tone sometimes we we make sound no yeah. hum like that yeah. with anger that uh, that the mere utterance reduced him to ashes so then what happened again let us go in the story shanen at that moment the goddess's own mount the carrier the lion with its mane trembling in fury let out a terrifying roar and charged into the midst of the demon army the idea is finding it unnecessary for the goddess herself to engage in battle with a leaderless demon army her mount the lion took up the fight on her behalf dhumra is gone 
uh, little less army. Uh, he was enough to annihilate that army. So here again, some. So the word is, the, the sloka is, shanena tad valam sarvam shayang nitang mahatmana tena kesharina devya bahanena atikopina. Here, the Singha called as Mahatman. That word in English also you understand, the noble one, Mahatman. Singha, a lion, a beast, how he became a Mahatman? Yes. Contemplate all that. What is the idea? The lion, the mount of the goddess, carries profound spiritual significance. When a spiritual aspirant fully surrenders body, mind, and life force at the feet of the divine power and is guided entirely by her will, the aspirant becomes her own vehicle. We can become her own vehicle. How? In such a state, the divine energy, knowledge, and bliss of the universal mother playfully manifest within the aspirant. Touched by such a state, the aspirant is transformed into a Mahatman, the noble soul. When the mother's energy, mother's knowledge uh, will play inside you, you will become a Mahatman, like the lion. So, but it happened, and, and what will happen? Again, the Shanena, uh, that uh, in a short span of time, aiding in the establishment of divine, he, he annihilated everything. It is sh the Shanena. Uh, with a, a, a short span of time, he killed the whole army. So what happened? Then Shumbha sent Chanda and Munda hmm. um, with a large army. A fierce battle ensued, but the Devi in her terrifying form as Kali, hmm, uh, the goddess, destroyed the demon forces and beheaded Chanda and Munda for this she earned the name Chamunda. <coughs> we can, um, but about Kali, it is a big topic. Hmm. But uh, it says Kali is so named because she controls time, the Kala. She is the bestower of the knowledge of the ultimate truth. Therefore, for the fulfillment of both worldly desires and liberations, one should worship her with the utmost effort. <coughs> so, uh, uh, we, we are skipping that part. So, the, then in the Purana, in the Chand, it says, the Rishi Uvacha, Rishi said, after the Taitha Chanda was slain and Munda was laid low, and many of the battalions were destroyed, the Lord of the Asuras, powerful Shumbha, with mind overcome by anger, commanded then the mobilization of all the Daitya hosts. That is the point. And he told, you go, you go. So let me uh, uh, read a little bit from that, you can, so that you can understand the situation. Uh, it is important to understand. Hmm. So he told, now let the 86 Asuras up raising their weapons with all their forces and the 84 Kambus surrounded by their own forces go out. So these words, Kambu, Maria, this is the family of Asuras, different, that group, that group. Huh? So let the 50 Asuras families of Koti Viryas, again a family, and the 100 families of Dhaumras go forth at my command. Let the Asuras, Kolakas, Dauridas, the Mauryas, and the Kalakeyas hasten at my command and march forth ready for battle. Battle. After issuing this order, Shumbha, the lord of the Asuras, and the ferocious ruler went forth, attended by many thousands of big forces. So, um, seeing that most terrible army coming, Chandika filled into space between the earth and the sky with the twang of her bowstring. It goes on, a bit like a warfare going on. So, they, uh, suddenly, uh, uh, there on, uh, uh, on hearing that roar, the enraged Asura battalions surrounded the lion, the Devi, Chandika, and Kali on all the four sides. So he, she was surrounded by that Asuras, only that uh, the Devi, Kali, and the lion. Hmm. At this moment, 
O king, in order to annihilate the enemies of devas and for the well-beings of the supreme devas, they are issued forth, endowed with exceeding vigor and strength, shaktis from bodies of Brahma, Shiva, Guha, Guha, another name of Kumara or Kartikeya or Skanda, hmm. Vishnu and Indra, this name you, you, you are familiar with. And with the form of those devas went to Chandika. So, one by one they came. Uh, now they have a leader called Rakta Bija. Rakta Bija was the, um, um, uh, they have a relation with Shumbha and Nishumbha also, they are relative. So that Rakta Bija come, he had a unique ability. Whenever a drop of his blood touched the ground, a new demon identical to him would spring forth. As the Devi attacked Rakta Bija, his blood spilled everywhere and an army of Rakta Bijas began to multiply. So it is a difficult hmm, uh, situation. To counter this, the goddess summoned Kali, who caught every drop of blood before it could fall to the ground. Thus, Rakta Bija was vanquished. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, this kind of picture you can see. Now you can understand a little better. Now, left with no choice, Shumbha and Nishumbha themselves took to the battlefield. But when they came, they found the Devi is not alone, as they understood. Hmm. Here is a thing. So we call, uh, there are different, uh, some, uh, how many shaktis, how many devis were there? We have difference of opinion. Some says sapta mataraha, there are seven. Some says it, it was eight. But it depends upon how you count, nothing else. Yeah. Uh, when you uh, counted the devi himself, it became eight. If you do not, then it is seven. Hmm. So who came? You will get this kind of this thing in um, eighth chapter. First came Brahman. So there is a reason behind. So this forms. So uh, uh, let us start with Brahman. The primordial energy of Brahma. She embodies the creative power, the essence of sound and the transcendental sound that is Shabda Brahma, because Brahma is the creator. So uh, out of anxiety, in this heightened anxiety, it says, uh, the devatas, you, you can understand, like uh, the, the pranam mantra of Holy Mother, yathaganer dahika shakti, Rama Krishna sthitahiya. Swami Saradananda, uh, he, he noticed that one. He wrote that one that way. So Agni, the fire, and the power to burn. If you think about fire, automatically you have to think the power to the capacity to burn. Huh. You can, you, you, may, you have to already try it. You started trying, no? Some, some, some flame, some fire flame, without the capacity of uh, burning, you may start it, maybe thank you, but you may discover something in future, maybe 100 years afterwards, you may be a flame uh, that does not have the power to burn. But see, already there is a notion in your mind, power to burn is not there. No? Eh? So thing is, this is called Shabda and Artha. The, sh the, the, the word and the meaning is always connected. Like, and Sri Ramakrishna gave another example, that uh, milk and, and the, the white color. I, maybe about 100 years after, you may discover thing, milk, that color has different, not white. But again, you see, the notion, it is not white. No? Eh? So, that's all, it's, it's connected with each other. So, Brahma and Brahmani. Brahma, the creator, the creator God. So, the Shakti, the capacity to create. So, that is the Brahmani. Hmm. Vishnu is killing Hiranyaksha, Hiranyakashipu. So, the power is Vaishnavi. That is the idea. So, in their heightened anxiety, when they were surrounded by the demon uh, army, the God's own divine energies, that is Shaktis, emanated 
from their bodies, these shaktis were essentially extension of the supreme goddess herself, who although manifesting among the gods, remained inherently one with the Mahadevi. So first came Brahmani. The creative, she embodied the creative power, the essence of sound, and the transcendental sound, the Shabda Brahma. She arrived in a swan-driven chariot. Why swan? Hamsa. The Sanskrit word for swan is hamsa. Ahamsa. Or so aham. This is the Vedic Mahavakyas. Yeah. I am he. Yeah. So it represents, hamsa represents soham. Hmm. So it came. Representing, representing the non-dual knowledge of Brahman. Following Brahmani came Maheshwari. The power of Maheshwara, that is Rudra, her primary function is that of dissolution. She stands behind the creative force of Shabda Brahma. For only when she brings destruction can creation follow. When, when Maheshwari breaks, Brahmani builds. They represent two sides of the same cosmic action. So that's why after Brahmani came Maheshwari. So there's a link, there's a deep link. So Maheshwari or Shivani, the Shiva, Maheshwar, Shiva, same ideas. So rides a bull on a bull. So what does a bull mean? And holding a tri trident in her hand and wearing the crescent moon on her forehead. This is the description in the meditation mantra. Her arms are adorned with two powerful serpents. The bull symbolizes dharma, righteousness. So bull is not a bull. It is a, is a representative which shows that our dharma, the righteousness. While the trident represents the transcendence of the three gunas, qualities, sattva, raja, and tamas, and the, sharp, and the knowledge of nirguna principle. The middle one is the sharp one, is the nirguna aspect. The crescent moon signifies compassion and gentle grace, even in the midst of martial severity. Like that, it goes on, goes on. So uh, to mention just, we can little bit of Komari and uh, uh, Barahi, we can talk about a little bit. Komari is the Shakti of Kumara, the, uh, the army general, Kartikeya Skanda of the, of the God's army that part. So how, he, um, so how, uh, what is the principle behind that? What is the idea behind that? It says, the Kaumari, the full embodiment of the power of Kumara, that is Kanda, she represents martial power and is the defender of righteousness. The term Shatra refers to protection from injury or harm. The word Shatriya, Shatriya, the word, I mean, is it that that army, the military personnel, it came from shata. Shata means wound. Wh when, when there is a wound in the society, whose duty is to, to, uh, to recover from the wound? It is shatriya, this police, this army personnel. So that's why from shata to shatriya. Shata means wound. Uh, 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 they will heal the wound of the society. So how it comes? Thus, Kumari never leaves a wound or an assault unavenged. One of her epithets is uh, Guha Rupini, for she hides her forces from the enemy's gaze, making her a master of war strategy. Riding a peacock and wielding a spear in her hand, she personifies the power to overcome desires. For the peacock is not swayed by lust, and its ability to consume serpents symbolizes the conquest of time. It goes on like that. Hmm. Then Barahi. Barahi, uh, that story, you can, um, that Baraha Avatara, the wild boar, uh, it, it killed in that story the Vishnu, uh, assuming a body of a wild boar, killed Hiranaksha. Hidden Naksha. So, how the, the, again, the demon, the name of the demon, there's a meaning. It says, so finally came Barahi, 
द पावर ऑफ यज्ञ वराह सो वी कॉल यज्ञ वराह यज्ञ मीन्स सेक्रीफाइस वराह मीन्स वाइल्ड बोर शी एज्यूम्स द फॉर्म ऑफ ए बोर हैविंग लिफ्टेड द आर्थ ऑन हर टास्क she embodied the power of sacrifice that is yagya when the earth descends into sin it is sacrifice that lifts and sustains her in that story you will find that hiranyaksha means whose very name signifies a life obsessed with gold symbolizing a purely hedonistic existence the name the of uh, who, uh, that vishnu in that uh, incarnation killed hiranyaksha hiranya aksha aksha came from akshi akshi means i senses its sole direction is towards hiranya hiranya means gold so materialistic so when the society will become only to 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 possession of gold 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 wealth wealth what is the what is the remedy of that idea of yagya sacrifice some people must come they would sacrifice their life and afford the idea of sacrifice yeah. so that's why the the, uh, the the picture is there that it uh, that if you see the baraha avatar the incarnation of baraha will find it's uphold the the earth the globe hmm, on its task yeah. and after that th- um, that when uh, it, it was done uh, he killed that enemy from that body different types of yagya started the sacrifice ritual started so everything there is a meaning behind the story so now <laughs> uh, we have to conclude uh, so there are many gods uh, goddesses huh? so shumbha found um, see the rishi wrote in, in now uh, we we are in 10th chapter the final chapter the rishi said rishi rubacha seeing his brother oh before that something happened no they, they killed uh, nishumbha Hmm, the devi killed nishumbha then um, uh, the the rishi said seeing his brother nishumbha slain who was dear to him as his life and his army being slaughtered shumbha angrily said little bit of disappointed no <laughs> uh, she said o durga o devi who are puffed up with the pride of strength don't show your pride though you are exceedingly haughty you resorting to the strength of others fight hmm. so the the thing is because it is the our uh, our title of the talk so uh, he uh, um uh, nishumbha's entire army has been decimated and his generals along with his brother nishumbha have been killed now shumbha the the asura stands alone on the battlefield in contrast goddess chandrika remain unscathed standing with the full strength of the goddesses by her side in a state of frustration and anger shumbha rebukes the goddess saying o durga you are fighting with the help of others so there is no reason for you to boast so uh, many explanation some explanation are there so shumbha accuses durga of fighting with strength of other deities such as brahmani and the other mother goddesses this implication behind shumbha's word is this you once proudly declared whoever defeats me in battle that the sugriva that messenger i will marry him who will defeat me in the battle means you are alone now you are deviating from your bow you are not alone but in reality you have been fighting relying on power of other goddess kali was the one who destroyed chanda and, and munda it was also kali who killed raktabija with the aid of brahman and other divine powers you have slain nishumbha therefore you have violated your initial vow of fighting independently in battle he told that now the devi uttered that one that aki aki vahan jagat yatra ditiya ka mama para pashyatam dushta maiye va vishantam mad vibhutaya see the devi says i am all alone in the world here not in the battlefield in the world i am alone hmm. what other is there besides me see 
vile one, these goddesses who are but my own powers entering into my own self. So behold me. He, he could not behold. They, they say, very beautiful. So uh, again, it was supporting from the Upanishad, from the, um, in the Chandogga, we get ekam eva advitiyam. Brahman is one and non-dual. Um, Brihadarana Kupanishad, natu dityam asti. There is no second. Neha nanasti kinchana in Kathopanishad. So, <coughs> it's I. I am alone here. There's a beautiful, in some other occasion, we can discuss about the Devi Sukta. I am, I am only one. A, a yogini, a, a, a nun, probably the, the daughter of the great sage Ambrin Bach, she realized his, in his realization, she narrates his experience, I am alone in, in this world. So you can get that story, that description in Devi Shukta. So in um, uh, so now you see with this statement, the illusion of distinction is dispelled. The perceived differences are not real. The goddess proclaims by the doctrine of non-duality is affirmed. You see, all this Brahmani, all those Shivani, Narasimhi, all those goddesses, they're entering into me. Behold that one. You see, it is I alone here. Um, there's a beautiful verse. It says, I am not separate from the universe, nor is the universe separate from me. Due to the non-duality between myself and the universe, who else exists apart from me? Just as curd is permeated by milk and the milk transforms into curd, in the same way I alone pervade the universe and the universe is entirely infused with my essence. A manifestation or bhivuti never possesses a distinct existence apart from its substratum or support. Uh, in, you can remember a little bit of Vedanta, uh, that, that snake rope analogy. Uh, so as there was, there was a rope, that's, that's why the rope appears as a snake. Substratum was the rope. As rope was there, then you could see a snake. If there was no rope, how could you can see a, uh, a, a snake? So something, sub, substratum is necessary. So I am the substratum of the universe. Hmm. Shumbha, due to his demonic intellect, is incapable of comprehending this subtle metaphysical truth. Thus, the goddess reveals to him directly that the powers of Brahmani, Vaishnavi, and others, one by one, dissolve back into her body. Hmm. Mm. The battle between the Devi and the Shumbha shook the cosmos then. But in the end, the goddess, with her supreme might, struck Shumbha down, restoring peace and order to the universe. The gods, now free from the tyranny of Shumbha and Nishumbha, return to their rightful places in heaven. They praised the goddess for her bravery, wisdom, and compassion, acknowledging her as the supreme power, the ultimate protector of the universe. The Devi, in turn, promised that whenever evil arose, she would return to vanquish it and protect the righteous. At the beginning, we started with bhaya. So in the 12th chapter, probably, you will get one verse there. The Devi himself is, is saying that who will listen, who will meditate, and who will believe, or maybe trust me as the mother of the universe, uh, he will overcome the fear. Yuddheshu charitang janme dushta daitta nivarhanam Tasmin strute bhairikritang bhayang pungsang na javete. The account of my exploits in the destruction of the wicked demons in battle, when heart dispels the fear 
of enemies in human beings. By reflecting upon the narrative of the goddess, goddesses' martial endeavors against the demonic forces, the devotee's mind gradually becomes firm in belief regarding the boundless power of his or her own mother. I have a mother. My obstructions may be great, it may be mighty, but if he feels, if there is this belief or idea gets strengthens, the practitioner become fearless. In this state, the practitioner no longer harbors any fear regarding the opposing forces that may create obstacles on the spiritual path. In Ram Prasad, he wrote a beautiful uh, song on that. Uh, the, he told, in the battles who, who comes with might, clad in the dusk of the night, bare and radiant, with sword held right, she rejoiced in the demon's plight. She started, my mother, it's my mother. Uh, he, she is there to kill all my obstacles. Uh, so at the end, he, uh, uh, he said, Dyuja Ram Prasad, his name was, Ram Prasad, the twice-born sage, says, what then is there to fear, engage? For in victory my triumph lies, in life and death my spirit flies. Hmm. So I do not even fear of my death. Hmm. I can fly over that. So uh, let us pray to the mother that after killing of Shumbha, mm -hmm. this goddess they assembled and praised the mother. So two verses from that, uh, that hymn. Devi prapannarti hare prasida prasida matar jagato khilasya prasida vishveshwari pahi vishwam tvamishwari devi chara charasya tang vaishnavi shakti rananta virya vishwasya vijang paramasi maya sammohitang devi samastameta tvang vai prasanna bhubi mukti hetu O Devi, you who remove the sufferings of your suppliants, be gracious, be propitious, O Mother of the whole world, be gracious, O Mother of the universe, protect the universe. You are, O Devi, the ruler of all that is moving and unmoving. You are the power of Vishnu, the endless valor. You are the primeval Maya, which is the source of the universe. By you all this universe has been thrown into an illusion. O Devi, if you become gracious, you become the cause of final emancipation in this world. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om Peace, Peace, Peace.